So there is also a piece in the Lagrangian which couples the composite Higgs with the composite fermions. And this is where you get the mass, right? So once the Higgs obtains a bear, then you, you, you give the T right and the T left a mass term, which couples the two. So the structure is, we have a coupling of a Higgs to the composite fermionic resonances, and then there's the mixing between the, the elementary or the elementary and the composites. This governs the structure of the standard model fermion masses. So in a way you could say that in this way you could explain the hierarchy of the standard model fermionic masses. Here you accommodate the structure but not explain the structure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I didn't dare to write down Randall syndrome because yeah. the, yeah. Yeah, so in Randall syndrome, uh, it's the, the dual description, then it becomes much more explicit, mm -hmm. as you know. <coughs> okay. Yeah, so next thing. You, could, you would modify also the couplings away from the standard model. So you, we're, how do you modify the couplings of the Higgs to the standard model? Well, you obtain a mass, but you also couple to the Higgs from this term. But you could say that, okay, there's, if you couple once, you could couple also several times. So I have three correlative flips in the, in the composite sector. So I would generate a mass term, which looks um, a term which looks like this, but then the h cubed as well with different coefficients here, right? In principle. Now this is where the number boltzmann boson nature of the Higgs comes in. Is since the, the Higgs is a number boltzmann boson, then the way it interacts with Q and T. The composite resonance is really by having by having factored out the the uh, this co this uh, the coset structure. So the, we factor out the Boltzmann boson from the field uh, from these composite resonances. So you see that there's some universality here, and this universality amounts to the fact that. These two interactions are related. There is just one function here, f of h over f, for all these terms. So it's the same Yukawa, the same Yukawa times a universal function. This is true as long as you sit in one multiplet of the S of i. So q and t are just one multiplet of S of i. Okay, so this has important consequences. Has important consequences for the following. So the, the, there's going to be a universal modification of the fermion couplings to the Higgs, and furthermore, the couplings of the Higgs to fermions is going to be, is going to be not flavor violetics. It's a flavor conserving universal modification. Okay. So, as I said, the modification of couplings to fermions is flavor universal. These Wilson coefficients in the effective Lagrangian are all the same. The size is model dependent. So it, the size is really uh, depends on what you assume for the, the embedding of the composite resonances into, uh, into the, the, uh, the structure. So if, if these fermions form a spin or four representation of S of I, then this would be the minimal composite Higgs model four. If they form a fundamental, which is a five dimensional, this would be a minimal composite Higgs model five. And the two functions are one over V squared or F squared for MC HM four, and a different function for MC HM four, uh, five. So there are two different functions, but they're flavor universal. So it's the same function, the same coefficient for different quarks. You also see that in these models, all these three-level Higgs couplings are suppressed by the strong dynamics. Right? It's always smaller than one. Okay. Now, okay, now we're ready to attack the loop couplings. Right? Now, these composite fermions 
can run in the Higgs to Google and Higgs to gamma gamma loop. So they will run in this loop, they couple to the Higgs, they are strongly, they have strong uh, quantum numbers because they couple to the quarks, so they could modify Higgs to glue glue. Right? So naively, for the mass of composite fermions, you would expect M, which is roughly F, so could be relatively light, several hundreds of uh, GV. Several hundreds of GV is dangerous, you could have large effects in Higgs to glue glue and Higgs to gamma gamma. However, because Higgs is a Goldstone boson, the, there is a cancellation which occurs in this in this coupling. So let's understand that. To you to do that, we we'll use the low energy theorem. So the way these heavy resonances modify the Higgs to glue glue coupling is by sitting in the mass matrix, and then you take the log determinant, the, the, the log derivative of the log determinant of this mass matrix. Now, since the Higgs is a Boltzmann boson, the structure of this determinant is very peculiar. It has a factorized form. There's this universal factor which sits in front, right, times some function which depends on the coefficients of the strong sector, the masses, and this uh, the f, the, 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 which gives me the scale of this strong sector. So it has a factorized form, there's this universal function which sits in front. Now you take the log, log of the determinant, log picks out a log of this function plus a log of p. And the Higgs only sits in the first universal piece. So that means that once you take a log derivative, this other piece completely drops out of the equation. In other words, the Higgs to glue glue couplings to, do not depend on the details of the spectrum of composites. They do not depend on lambda i, m i, and m. The modification is actually the same as if you just rescale the topic now as we did before. Right? So you see that there is a cancellation going on. The, the fact that you have these extra resonances, you don't see it right? to this leading order. For instance, in this MCHM5, the Higgs to, to uh, the production, so glue glue to Higgs, divided by the standard model is just the modification of the top you got. Okay. Now, you see that we have this structure which boils down to relatively simple modifications of the Higgs to fermion couplings and the Higgs to glue glue couplings. The same, the same for the Higgs to uh, gamma gamma. No? So now you can, we can use this uh, simplified effective field theory fits that we show that we were talking about in the first lecture. So at the end of the day, we only have two free parameters: the this modification of the top, the b and the tau, is the same right, for all species, and then there is the change to the to the uh, coupling of the Higgs to the W and the C. Right? So that this composite Higgs exactly matches onto the, the feet where you float the couplings to the W and the Z and the couplings to the, fer the fermions. <coughs> of course, it will be in a correlated way at the end of the day because everything will be a function of B squared or F squared. But the different models will just be one-dimensional curves in this parameter space. Right? This is from CMS, this is from ATLAS. I also wanted to show that the <coughs> phenomenologists are, are, can combine the two, so if you gain more, of course, if you have combined two experiments, you're closer to the standard model with different color coding for different contributions. Of CV versus CF. As I said, different models will correspond to different one dimensional curves here, so let's see what we can learn if you, uh, if you explicitly 
the demand that the modification is to, due to a particular composite Higgs model. Then we only have one parameter, which is V over F. What's on the left hand side is delta chi squared, so that's one sigma, two sigma, three sigma exclusion. So you want to have V over F with seeds which has to be smaller than this number at one sigma, or smaller than that number at two sigma, or smaller than that number at three sigma. If you see, if your model is the minimal composite Higgs model with uh, the spinorial representation, so MCHM4. <coughs> and you see that they have different constraints on this, uh, the, the F, scale F, for different, uh, for different, Composite X models. So at 3 sigma in MCHM4, the bound is roughly 450 GeV on the 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 pi constant. The in MCHM5 at 620 GeV, and if you include also electric precision tests, is bigger than 900 GeV. I, I, I'm sorry, the the minimum chi squared. Uh, It's the difference between the minimum? No, I, I, I mean for the composite Higgs model, the minimum chi square seems to appear at the uh, V square over F square on equal to on two. Yeah, but it's less than a sigma. No? So why, why, why? You see this bump here? Yeah. Between the, uh, the standard model is at zero. No? So you see that the difference is less than one sigma, but you plug in one degree of freedom. So you should gain a delta chi square, which is one, because so you can't distinguish between the two. <coughs> okay. Now, the rest of the talk, uh, I'll spend on the other searches. So if you uh, fell asleep or got lost, this is a completely separate part of the talk. So <coughs> you can come back. Uh, one can look for non-standard topics of the Higgs also uh, in other ways. So I will talk about whether it covers the dark matter, CP violating Higgs couplings, flavor violating couplings, and so on. Now, the Higgs portal to dark matter was already covered by Professor Ko, so I'll be very quick. The main thing here is that H dagger H is the lowest dimensional gauge invariant operator in the standard model. So you, you somehow if you naturally think about what types of operators you can write down, this will be the part where you would hit the, the standard model first, just ordering in dimensions. So for instance, if you have a scalar S, which is the dark matter, then you already have a dimension, the dimensionless so dimension 4 operator with a dimensionless coupling, a renormalizable operator, and the same coupling governs the relative bar abundance and the Higgs to invisible, if S is lighter than the half of the Higgs mass. So now there are bounds on the branch ratio of Higgs to invisible. For instance, you can, depending on what you assume for the deviations in these couplings, for instance, if you float everything, luckily there's also a search by Atlas where you have a C plus H final step where H goes to invisible so the degeneracy is broken. And you see that you, at 95% confidence level, this branching ratio has to be smaller than 55% or so. Now, as I said, one coupling governs both the relic abundance, so you need lambda H SS on but with the value on the, on the y-axis such that you get the right relic abundance as a function of the dark matter mass. Now for these very low masses you can also decay, the, the Higgs can also decay into dark matter, but this is bounded by the branching ratio. So the coupling has to be smaller than this, therefore this part is excluded. Right? You cannot get the right relic abundance because you would have a branching ratio which is too so that, in other words, the, the Higgs portal with 
uh, uh, light scalar dark matter is excluded. The same thing for the continuum convex uh, dark matter. Okay. <coughs> the next topic is the CP violating Higgs couplings. So you could imagine that there is extended sector where you have CP, uh, not just CP conserving, but also CP violating couplings that would modify the whole story. For instance, in EFT description, you have these extra pieces where you have the WLW tilde and DV tilde. So at the end, after accurate symmetry breaking, you have the edge FF dual, so the CP violating uh, decay to, to, to photons. Now the fact to ZZ in WW is minuscule because these are already three level couplings in the standard model, while in the UV theories they'll be generated at loop levels, so something like this. You have uh, <coughs> two fields, there's CP violating couplings sitting there, and you'll get the, uh, at one loop you'll generate these types of of uh, operators. So I'll focus on Higgs to gamma gamma. On the next slide, we'll see that there's bounds because you generate electron EDM. So from a diagram like this, you would generate an ele electronic uh, electric dipole moment for the for the electron, and the bounds are severe. So the scale, this effective scale that you need, is in the order of 50 TV or so. Or if you want to. Uh, translate this into the branch inertia for x to gamma gamma, it's a very small branch inversion. Uh, now the next thing that you can uh, think of is that there could be flavor violating uh, Higgs couplings. So from, from these uh, higher dimensional operators, you could have flavor violating couplings there, again depending on the theory. And in general, thus you have a master but the, the couplings here need not be the flavor diagonal in the same basis as the masses are. So that would result in new neutral currents. So the flavor diagonal uh, modifications you can, you can look for at the LHC, the flavor violating at, let's say, Bell 2 and LHC. And in order to understand what's going on, you really need to measure both of them. For instance, what would be the, the size that you should aim for? If you don't want to have any tuning in the quark mass basis, roughly these off diagonals should be smaller than these chain share ansatz. So the, the, the should be smaller than the geometric mean of the diagonal values. If you go into different flavor models, then you will find different patterns for the diagonal and the off diagonals. In the standard model, everything was normalized to one, and then at some point, depending on what your model is, you start switching on the flavor violating couplings. Now, the surprising here, thing here one, perfect. Uh, so the surprising thing here is that if you look at Higgs to tau mu, actually the LHC is most constraining already. There's no direct dedicated study, but if you just look at the Higgs to tau tau and recast it, you see that the Higgs already, the, the LHC already wins over the low energy experiments. Now that's this blue line here. Uh, and you can look at the details offline. It's a very busy plot. Now I have two more slides and then I'll conclude. So uh, there's other processes that you, want, you might want to look at, for instance, dihigs production. Why this is important is because if you have only looking at the processes with a single Higgs, you cannot know whether you have an SU2 doublet or not. If you are close to the standard model with the couplings, you might suspect that you have a doublet. However, the number of the parameters that you have when you write down an EFT with just a single edge or an EFT with this edge dagger edge, which is the, sing the, the electric singlet, is exactly the same. So you can't know. Unless you look at processes with, with uh, two Higgses. So for instance, the Higgs production in the standard model would break this degeneracy. This can also be, you, I mean, the way to think about it is that you could modify these guys here by having extra particles running in the loop. You have a Higgs production again. Okay. Now, uh, 
If you want to test whether you have composite, uh, composite sector or not, the really important thing is to search for these composite resonances. One way is to look at the WW scattering, where you have these vector resonances completing the unitarization of the WW scattering. Okay, so now let me conclude. So, <clears throat> so the first thing I want to say is that in some way the discovery of the light standard model Higgs light particle was not unexpected. No? It's really in the same way that the charm and the top quark were first seen in the virtual effects, also the Higgs was seen in the virtual effects, so the, in the electronic precision data and the radiative corrections. Now, the question is whether something similar can happen also when you perform the precision measurements of the Higgs couplings. As we saw, the radiative corrections of beyond standard model physics can modify the Higgs couplings. So if you measure them precisely, maybe there's going to be a pattern there which will point toward an extended sector. We've seen that there are correlated deviations in the explicit models and this, and right now, this already puts non-trivial constraints on the new physics models. Thank you. Other questions for Professor Zupa? So you gave a very nice introduction to a composite model based on SO5 of the SO4. So my question is, is there a explicit uh, known gauge theory which really have uh, such uh, pattern of global symmetry based from SO5 to SO4 or what um, Okay, so I think the closest would be uh, uh, I think it's already in the orig original uh, Agashe uh, dial paper. So, of course, the way you really look at this is you go into the dual description. So what you really are talking about is the conformal Higgs. So you would go into the RS description and then there is a, a, I think that's the closest you would get. I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, of course, it's, it's a hard problem, no? Because even in the QCP, you don't really have there's no proof that this uh, breaking occurs, no? I mean, you know that it occurs, but you don't really have a proof that you have this star symmetry breaking at the end of the day, no? I mean, the, the phenomenology does look like you have uh, the, uh, the defiance are the most of bosons, right? Now, you're asking even a harder question, no? Yeah, so, uh, uh, <coughs> We had David Dean gave a lattice talk, so at the end of the day, probably these questions can only be settled by doing lattice uh, calculations. No? But uh, indirectly, it's just uh, you take a you, you take a Carl uh, 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 a Carl condensate and you assume that it's uh, it will drive the, the, the symmetry breaking, no? and then it just depends on. Uh, the assignments of the, of the fields that you put in. So this part was done. Uh, uh, global structure. Right? So 
is there's a global structure, which is completely left out symmetric in this case. But then you have elementary periods, which are not part of this uh, uh, complete matrix, let's say, they explicitly break the global structure. So through this breaking, you get, you, you get the, uh, first of all, you'll get the Higgs mass, which fits back in, and also um, the, um, I mean, <laughs> it's getting more and more complicated, but the, the left hand, right? I don't understand, it's just like a map. Uh, you have a bigger explicit breaking in the quantum mass, it's a regular map, it's fast. Uh, not Forget about the, the elementary quarks, okay? If you forget about the elementary quarks, this uh, it's a it's a parity even uh, uh, unlike the standard model. No, this thing is a vector-like theory, right? So it's different than the points. Okay, they are making sense. So this is not SU two left cross SU two right in the standard model. It's the SO four. It's a global symmetry, which is a vector-like theory. So the the the, the low-lying state is a is a scalar. Yeah, but the final state. Yeah, yes, that's exactly the same. So in the minimal tungsten model, so when you generate a, a premium mass for a standard model uh, premiums, uh, when you consider all three generations, you still generate only one mass right? in this setting because the rank of this Yukawa matrix will be one. Uh, is this is the time model that I show? Yes, That's exactly right. So, so what do you do to change this? Well, you have to have enough copies of the uh, of these extra fields. So, so you have three. You could introduce more hints of this. Type. No, no, no. You don't need more hints. You need Not more of more considerations. More, uh, extra premiums. Yeah, and then if you think maybe it's easier for you to think about the RS. No, in the RS, the way it uh, arises is that each each of the fermion fields, uh, I mean, you have three generations of the, the fields there, right? So the, in the same way, here you have the mixing with three generations of the composite uh, resonances, so that the rank of the matrix that you get will be three. In the top model, you're right, I just had one generation to have a simplified description that the rank would be one, and you 